Good afternoon to you wherever you are from here in Norway. I'm Christian Einarsson, and as the chair of the IPA's Freedom to Publish Committee, I had the pleasure of also sharing the INSPIRE workshop on Freedom to Publish. As you will see, the five workshops follow the similar format, exploring first the challenges, then the opportunities, and also coming up with some ideas for potential partnerships. Just to give you some context, one of IPA's primary objectives is to fight censorship and to safeguard the fundamental freedom of expression, freedom to publish, and freedom to access information. IPA defends the rights of authors and publishers to create and distribute the works of the mind in complete freedom. Starting with the challenges, the most prevalent and possible the most effective is self-censorship, which is, of course, almost invisible and very difficult to measure. Self-censorship happens systematically and instinctively and is a consequence of legal and social structures designed to keep people in line. What keeps it working is, like other forms of censorship, fear of personal or financial harm. Whether that is a threat of arrest or physical harm, or something we are seeing more and more, which are so-called strategic lawsuits against public participation, known as slaps, which burden the victim with the cost of legal defense until they abandon the criticism or opposition. The second big challenge is direct pressure from the state and authorities itself. Without appropriate checks and balances in place, freedom-hating state authorities have at their disposal an array of strategies to silence publishers and writers. These include, but are not limited to, arrests and detonation public shaming for unpatriotic content, withholding of ISBNs to prevent, prevent publications, manipulations of the judiciary to have criticists branded as criminals, and also co-opting the religious authorities. We've seen numerous examples where the application of external pressure from communication campaigns have had some success in counteracting these abuses and sometimes getting people released from prison. It is very difficult for abusers to ignore loud criticism when it comes from a united front of publishers, authors, and other stakeholders in multiple countries. Third, in our work, in our group, we identified social pressure as an increasingly powerful deterrent to free expression and freedom to publish. Social media is a perfect means to rapidly shut someone down through posting for apparent wrong think, for wider shaming, and by building momentum to have writers, publishers, and others deplatformed or even canceled altogether. This problem requires dialogue with the tech platforms and also other popular media that are not pol policing the problem effectively enough today. And then within our own publishing houses, we need to make sure that we have an ongoing conversation about the principles of freedom to publish and the courage to publish what we deem worth publishing. Fourthly, is something that is at the center of a debate in some countries at the moment which is the concern that emergency powers granted to governments, such as movement tracking, access to health data, and so on, as a result of the COVID-19 crisis, will stay in place longer than it is necessary. This is concerning for freedom of expression in the slippery slope sense. The erosion, the erosion of freedoms is rarely limited to one kind of freedom only. Now for the opportunities. Our workshop group felt that unpleasant and concerning though it is, the increasing polarization of opinion 
actually offers an opportunity to start new conversations with big tech. These platforms are under increasing pressure with demands for greater accountability and the expectation that they will act to reduce the divisions. And publishers could have a key role in this shift. By leveraging our role as stewards of truth to shed light on the issues at the heart of this polarization, and also by increasing public understanding of it. Secondly, digital advances are presenting a lot of new opportunities for freedom to publish. From the development of ebooks to circumvent blockades or banned print content, to optimizing our own use of social media, to a powerful tool to pressurize abusive governments and freedom to publish upon opponents. We should be thinking of digital first strategies in publishing because it is clear that much can be achieved if we, may, if we make best use of these tools alongside their traditional counterparts. As you know, Inspire is about collaboration for the benefit of all publishing stakeholders. And this spirit of collaboration is something we can leverage now to develop effective tools and strategies to promote and to protect freedom to publish. By working with the right organizations, we could lead benchmarking of libel and other laws in different territories to enable publishers associations to lobby their governments for fairer and clearer laws. In the same way, a freedom to publish index, the publishers associations catalog the abuses in their countries using a points based system would facilitate reporting and tracking. This exists for press already, but not for book publishing. So who can help us achieve our objectives? Who do we need to talk to more? Firstly, we identified civil society, which is a broad term covering the United Nations agencies, <clears throat> sorry, all the NGOs and other value-based bodies that care about freedom of expression. For our purposes, this would imply recognition of freedom to publish as an issue in its own right. And then agreement on an international def definition of freedom to publish as a subset of freedom of expression. One of my other jobs at the moment is setting up the first World Expression Forum, VEXFO, which will take place on 30th to 31st of May this year in Lillehammer, Norway. World Expression Forum is one example of an international organization that stands ready to partner with the publishing ecosystem on advocating for freedom to publish. And this, another sector we should be talking to more systematically is the media in general. As I have highlighted already, communications is everything when it comes to advocacy. And we need the media support to get our message out further and wider. We have a great opportunity as well because the world of freedom to publish is full of inspiring, eye-catching stories, which is all journalists really want. It is also very important to cooperate with authors and all the other stakeholders in the publishing world. It is often said that book fairs are the water cooler of the publishing world. They are where connections are made and reinforced, information exchanged, and agendas are set. Book fairs offer a prominent platform from which to amplify our messages and raise awareness of freedom to publish violations around the world. The IPA and National Publishers Association already work closely with book fairs on a sporadic basis, but formalizing the freedom to publish element of these relationships through debates, keynotes, thematic installations, and so on, would really help to enchange and enhance the work we're doing in this field. One particularly stealthy way authorities are censoring content is through cleansing it during the translation process. Often such edits are not reported back to publishers, which means that in some countries, 
a book no longer corresponds to the originals, which is a violation of the freedom to publish. Countering this problem, in particular, will mean working closely with translators and with booksellers, perhaps to develop systems to check the translations on bookstore shelves are faithfully reproduction of, which, of the original. If not, then the author and the publisher need to know so they can decide if they want to take action. I think this sums up a very inspiring and impressive working group session. Thank you all that participated. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Karini Pansa. I'm the Vice President of the International Publishers Association. Last month, I chaired Inspire workshops looking at the challenges and opportunities around diversity and inclusion. We had a rich discussion around this topic, which is enjoying an enormous amount of attention around the world currently, and that can only be a good thing. The participants during my workshop were fully engaged and their exchanges were open and honest with many heartfelt thoughts and experiences put on table. We have distilled from those conversations the most complete ideas. By now, the case for diversity and inclusion has been made. Not only it is the right thing to do from an ethical standpoint, but it has been robustly demonstrated that businesses that integrate DNI into the way they operate. From staff recruitment and management to company output, especially in the case of publishing, are more innovative, creative, and profitable. Our group started the discussion by considering the overreaching question of how to turn good intentions, well-meaning statements, and on-paper commitments into real actions and outcomes. This starts with defining what it meant by diversity and inclusion in each context. There are so many social identifiers from gender, sexuality, religion, and migratory background to socioeconomic status, education level, level of physical ability, and more. Whatever the chosen definition, companies need to demonstrate their progress through formal reporting practices, which will inspire others and foster more collaboration. The first challenge is directly linked to the second one, which is creating measurable standards for reporting statutes and progress on DNI. Comparing apples with oranges requ requires opinions. So what is needed is a universally applied set of targets and metrics by which companies can benchmark themselves and others. DNI is a huge topic and publishing is the node industry built on prejudices and biases. So it is very difficult to map statutes, progresses and objectives. What is more, many companies don't know where to seek guidance which is why we felt that knowledge sharing across territories could be so useful. Changing company cultures and the way publishing is perceived as an industry was our next big challenge. In some countries, such as UK, publishing is assumed to be a predominantly white middle-class profession and therefore unwelcoming to other demographics. This needs to change, which happens when we change the narrative about the industry through targeted communications and working with schools and universities. It, is, it also happens when companies mainstream DNI into the way they recruit and manage staff, allow a diverse workforce to influence their publishing output and therefore reach new audiences. Naturally, it is harder for smaller publishing houses to implement major change, but there is always something that can be done, whatever the size is. 
inclusivity is all about understanding and breaking down barriers to inclusion. This means identifying who is being excluded or othered, whether by design or due simply to lack of awareness of minorities, including undeserved language groups. It is human nature to seek to what we know, and in publishing, this can manifest as unconscious avoidance of content that is outside of our comfort zone. However, paying proactive action to minority cultures and languages is a good way to win the attention and loyalty of new audiences. And in educational publishing, have a direct ameliorating impact on educational outcomes. One collateral effect of the pandemic has been the accelerated uptake of familiarity with tech-based communications. We saw book tours and book fairs substituted by social media-based interactions and readings. Authors managed to grow their follower bases through two-way digital conversation. And it would be a mistake to let these relationships fade. In the same way, millions of people are newly initiated in the use of technology for homeschooling, which has opened new doors for educational publishers. As I said previously, DNI is a hot topic today. So now it is the time to broaden and deepen our expertise in this year in this area through training and capacity building. This is much to learn to do, from deprogramming implicit biases to tackling commonly held and often false assumptions about already having the skills and knowledge. It starts with identifying the gaps, ascertaining who's missing from the conversation and, invite, and inviting them to join. Reverse mentorship is one example of a very positive way to turn up the volume on the unheard voices and make sure decision-making is fully representative. During our workshop, numerous participants cited examples from the pandemic experience where publishers had established new partnerships to create networking opportunities and find new audiences. This included collaboration with book fairs, bookstores, and libraries, with higher attention given to translation, which, as I have said, is a proficient strategy for inclusive publishing that reaches unfamiliar linguistic groups and demographics. As we tentatively move past the pandemic mindset, we should all seek to apply what we learned and bring that experience with us. So having listed our challenges and opportunities, we then brainstormed some ideas on which partners in the book chain we could work closely with to tackle the challenges and exploit these opportunities. Firstly, as I mentioned early, the group felt that book fairs can play a vital role in facilitating relationships platforming issues and speakers, and rising the profile of different actors in diverse sectors. We already see this happening in somewhat ad hoc way, but formal partnerships with the book fairs community could re-up enormous benefits by catalyzing conversations on DNI and providing a bridge across which all stakeholders in the book ecosystem can reach each other. On the question of standardization, I have explained how the group believed that setting common, comparable metrics is a priority. But who's qualified to do this? There are many standard bodies, but if we work closely with one that can develop a system for measuring DNI across the publishing sector, then it will enable better mapping and faster progress. Finally, we thought it makes sense to work with the library community, which is very clearly on the same page as us when it comes to diversity and inclusion. Like bookstores and book fairs, libraries are open gateway to readers and can help us better understand audiences 
so we can produce the books they need. So I'll leave that there. As I said, this is a vast subject, but one that our industry needs to move forward on as a matter of urgency. I believe that INSPIRE has given us the stimulus we need to make important strides on DNI and other issues. And I look forward to being part of that. Thank you. Hello, my name is Michiel Kolman. I'm the chair of the IPA's Inclusive Publishing and Literacy Committee. I was very glad to chair the INSPIRE Sustainability Workshop on January the 19th, and I found it extremely useful and insightful as an additional step forward in the IPA's continuing sustainability journey after the Sustainability Summit we held in Frankfurt last October at the Buchmesse. At this workshop, we had 12 participants representing organizations inside and outside the IPA membership, which meant we could consider various points of view from right across the publishing ecosystem. Using some of the key takeaways from the Sustainability Summit as our jump off, which I'm more than happy to share with you, just let me know. We asked the groups to think slightly differently about the challenges and the opportunities and actions we need to take by applying the collaborative lens of INSPIRE. Now, let me share some slides with you. So the premise of the discussion was the unavoidable fact that the SDG 2030 agenda will be unattainable unless we agree on industry-wide approaches. So specifically, we asked, who should we work with? Where is more cooperation needed on achieving the SDG goals and on addressing climate action? And where should we focus on our attention first? And finally, what are the roadblocks we would likely face? And we managed to agree on several important areas where the publishing sector can and should adopt a more strategic, proactive and targeted approach to collaboration and partnership. So firstly, the question, which are the organizations and sectors we should be building a relationship with? And you see it's here. The groups identified three main inside and outside the publishing sector that we need to get closer to. The first one is book fairs. Book fairs and book festivals are the perfect platform to galvanize the industry to action and accelerate the flow of information around sustainability. What is more, they're always on the lookout for partnerships that increase their relevance and impact. We provide the speakers, they provide the platform. It's so easy. Second one is distributors. Publishers currently have a purely transactional relationship with the distribution sector, and that's a wasted opportunity. We can work with distribution stakeholders of all sizes on initiatives with immediate tangible benefits, such as print on demand, initiatives to reduce fuel consumption, and sustainably managing remainders, for instance, by selling them on through intermediate distributions rather than simply pulping them. And finally here in this category is each other. There is such a huge range of publishing houses around the world, all moving at different speeds on the issues of sustainability and the SCDs. Sustainability is about what is best for humanity. It's not carry the same competitive sensitivity as other business practices. And there is for every reason for all of us to share our secrets, so to say, with each other. And what about outside our sector? Well, the first category is civil society, specifically the UN, international government organizations and NGOs. The whole sector is by definition geared towards best practice on sustainability. And we could learn a lot from them. The IPA, based in Geneva, has established relationships with WIPO, the WTO and UNESCO, but there is scope for broadening that further to include other UN agencies and specific IGOs and NGOs. The second category is other creative industries. As the IPA is often at pains to point out, publishing is worth more money than music and film combined. Yet there are more prom they are more prominent in public consciousness. There's everything to gain from working together on the issue of sustainability 
as one creative sector with shared values and objectives. And then the libraries. The library community is another where we would be well to find and explore common ground on sustainability. And there are lots of opportunities. Libraries provide an ecologically sustainable service because it's based on resource sharing, one book, many readers. It's also very clear that publishers and libraries share common values in terms of the SDGs. And that's the right thing to do is to work together here. In the latter part of the workshop, we asked the groups to come up with specific ideas for steps we can take on climate change today. Here is a list of the more concrete initiatives proposed. First, resource sharing. We can look at sharing best practices for book designers, production managers, marketing material, and distribution and packaging, including the IPA Academy. This could include toolkits, guidelines on how to improve and roll out sustainable practices across companies. Second, the in, an international climate action aggregator, like the resource at the SDM has on its site called Scholarly Publishing and Action on Climate Change, which catalogs sustainable initiatives and research. The third one is standard carbon footprint measurement. Many organizations are developing carbon calculator, which means duplication and inconsistencies. A single industry standard is needed alongside programs to promote and guide companies towards carbon neutrality. We could also benefit the closer PA corporations like publishers. PAs are moving at different speeds. Those in developing economies need support to help them mainstream sustainability in their work. And finally, the sustainability standards. We can look at creating new standards and certification beyond FSC, like those imposed on publishers to ensure our products are manufactured, distributed, and delivered to customers in a sustainable way. So you will wonder, what does SDG cooperation look like? And I think here we must make a distinction between inside our sector and outside our sector. So inside our sector, I think there are three important uh, points to make. First, it's about housekeeping. We should get, as publishers, our house in order. The second one is sharing. We must share the best practices and knowledge. This can really result in what we call mutual upskilling. And finally, I think it's really powerful to speak with one voice. That's how we can promote the SDGs, the output, and the progress we are planning to make. Now, outside our sector, I think it's all about communication. We should amplify the messages that we get from the UN, from the NGOs. And we need a program, a program on book access, a program on education, which also covers, of course, gender equality. All right, thank you so much. This is all for me. Uh, I cannot wait to see all the outcomes from all uh, the Inspire program. Thank you. Hello, I'm very pleased to share with you some of the most important takeaways from the discussion that took place during the Inspire Technology and Innovation Workshop in January. In case you don't know me, I'm Jose Borghino, and I'm the Secretary General of the International Publishers Association, which is based in Geneva, Switzerland. I'll give you a short overview of what I'm going to present in a moment, but to set the scene, Technology and innovation was identified by the Inspire Task Force as one of the biggest issues that the book sector, which extends far beyond publishers, needs to prioritize. The purpose of Inspire, the International Sustainable Publishing Industry Resilience Initiative, is to encourage and enable all players in the book sector to start thinking of themselves as part of an integrated, mutually reinforcing ecosystem and more importantly, to work together. As a group, our workshop tried to identify the most pressing challenges around technology and innovation, as well as the immediate opportunities and to choose the stakeholders we should be attempting to build lasting partnerships with, enabling us to better understand and exploit technology and to energize innovation. So 
starting with the challenges, we began thinking about the question of mindsets. It's clear that to many people, the prospect of change is a daunting one. And when that change involves adopting new and unfamiliar technologies, then it can be downright frightening. But fear of the unknown is best overcome by getting to know the frightening thing, which means education, upskilling publishers to be comfortable using new technology and familiarizing them with the enormous benefits that it brings. The IPA Academy is one example of a way we are trying to do this, but training and upskilling must also happen at a local level. Secondly, we identified the difficulties in connecting directly to readers and developing a relationship with them. In the bricks and mortar business model, it is the booksellers who enjoy that direct B2C link. But through technology, publishers can now open new two-way channels of communication and start talking to consumers in a way that wasn't possible before. Then the group considered issues around distribution which are loosely linked to the previous challenge. How can publishers leverage technology to increase digital distribution, especially in analog markets? This is something that needs to be carefully considered since we definitely do not want to burn our bridges with booksellers, but through innovation, we can try to find solutions that benefit them as well, perhaps by helping them to sell more eBooks, audiobooks, and so on. Fourth is the thorny quandary of an incredibly crowded and fiercely competitive media marketplace. How does the book business compete more effectively with subscription-based streaming and social media, which are so successful at occupying billions of eyeballs every day? Surely there are new digital business models to be defined, perhaps by copying the secret source of streaming can we ally to that some of the compelling communications and marketing strategies that spotlight the social, intellectual and health benefits of reading? We felt some important inroads could be made here. Finally comes the unavoidable question of artificial intelligence and its still undefined future impacts on copyright. AI raises a plethora of questions about how to protect works and is an area where rights owners and rights holders need to keep a watchful eye. What is certain is that adapted licensing solutions will be needed, as well as systems that can detect access to all protected works along the lines of the YouTube content ID, although there's currently no equivalent for books. Moving on to the opportunities, there are probably no surprises here, although remember that this is a non-exhaustive list so if you can think of something that has been overlooked, we do want to know about it. Please get in touch with me. The first big opportunity is blockchain technology. For years, we've heard about the unlimited potential of the blockchain to improve efficiency and streamline workflows from managing intellectual property agreements and royalty payments to tracking physical in-store and online purchases. But so far, its uptake in the publishing sector remains minimal because not enough, enough of us understand it properly yet, and we're still waiting to see what happens. But blockchain proponents are urging publishers to get on the front foot with this technology, so maybe it's time. You'll notice that our second opportunity was also one of the challenges. While AI is causing rights holders concern, it also promises to be a very useful tool in book production such as voice-generated audiobooks. It is important that we decipher the mysteries of AI and turn it to our collective advantage, both in terms of the products publishers make and the way they are protected. Then the group identified the potential that could be unleashed through adapted licensing that would enable the movement of content from developed markets into their less developed counterparts. The workshop group felt that this would entail a decisive reviewing of licensing arrangements, which must also include robust digital piracy monitoring provisions. Lastly, 
we thought about the way different markets and sectors are moving at different speeds and how this is in no one's interest in a globalized world. Just as vaccine equity is not a local problem, but a global one, it makes sense for those who are out in front to share what they've learned with those who are lagging. An example raised during our workshop was STM Publishing, which is ahead of the technology game in many respects and could share its knowledge with other publishing segments. The last question we asked was, where is more cooperation needed along the book value chain for us to better meet the challenges and actualize the opportunities? First among these is authors who should be invited into the book production process higher upstream than they often are today. Publishers would not exist without authors and authors with publishers are much better off than those that go it alone. The quality of the product is much higher, its reach further and its financial return greater when it is born of a strong publisher author relationship. Secondly, we need to work closely with governments and specific ministries to make sure the publishing sector is considered in the big policy decisions around adoption of technologies and to ensure we're seen as a critical player in the domains where we're most present, including education, culture, and the digital economy. Distributors are another important player that we need to build stronger bridges with. It's very encouraging that the International Publishing Distribution Association is one of the signatories of the Inspire Charter, and we certainly hope to develop a productive collaboration with them in the coming months and years. Distribution is an essential link in the chain, and we should be trying to get the big players, digital and analog, to talk to us as soon as possible. There are big gains to be made, especially in developing economies where there remain access and market evolution challenges that can only be answered through innovative distribution solutions. There are several areas where the IPA already cooperates with the other creative industries, such as the WIPO for Creators Initiative at the World Intellectual Property Organization, but there's no reason it should end there. It makes good sense for the publishing world at all levels to be talking to our friends from music, games, and film to see what we can learn from each other. Again, Inspire is about finding and occupying the common ground. And this is one example where there is everything to gain by keeping an open channel to the adjacent industries, which are not in direct competition. The last area identified is something of a no brainer but one where we can certainly do better. Publishers need to work more closely with other publishers. To quote Jose Manuel Anta from another workshop, publishers should stop acting as, we, as if we were islands and start acting as archipelagos, sharing knowledge and resources and spreading costs where possible. If appropriately managed, there are real potential benefits to replacing the competitive reflex with a cooperative one, such as across borders and between markets and along the global north-south divide. So that's it from me. I hope these findings have been of interest and value to you. Please keep an eye on our communications channels for developments in the INSPIRE plan over the coming months. And in the meantime, please get in touch with us at the IPA if you have any feedback or inputs you want to share. Many thanks, goodbye. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on your time zone. My name is Jessica Sanger, and I'm the chair of the IPA's Copyright Committee. I'm also director of European and International Affairs at the German Publishers and Booksellers Association, Börsenfein. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to present some of the main points discussed during the INSPIRE workshop on copyright, which we held via Zoom on the 20th of January. As you may be aware, copyright is one of the two pillars of the IPA's mission, the other being freedom to publish. So these issues are really at the heart of IPA's work. 
As the international voice of publishing, the EIPA and its members hold the view that copyright is a flexible and effective system that benefits the public interest. As such, it is part of a coherent system of fundamental rights and freedoms enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Copyright reinforces the creative freedom of authors because it gives them the financial independence to express themselves freely. It is also the mechanism that allows publishers to invest in creativity and develop, develop a healthy, innovative market for literary, recreational, educational, and academic works. With this as our starting point, I asked the workshop participants to identify the main challenges to copyright that we currently see around the world and to explore some of the opportunities that the publishing ecosystem can and should be seizing. In this context, we also considered which partners to collaborate with in our efforts to support a strong copyright framework. I've summarized on this slide what the workshop participants thought were the most important challenges facing copyright today. We also considered some ways of addressing them. One concern is that in some parts of the world, copyright laws need to be modernized to support digital business models. A healthy market for digital publications requires a full set of exclusive rights, as well as appropriate enforcement mechanisms. Where either of these are lacking, the digital transition may be hampered. The second challenge we identified is the importance of achieving and implementing appropriate enforcement mechanisms and actions to tackle physical and online piracy effectively. This may take different forms depending on local contexts and needs, but the essence is the same globally. We need more than ever to explain to legislators and sometimes law enforcement the considerable social, economic and cultural harms that piracy causes. Third is the concerning shortfall in understanding and awareness of copyright among a range of audiences. If we are to protect and strengthen copyright, the foundation of the publishing industry, then it is paramount that every stakeholder, from students and teachers to consumers, the judiciary and policymakers, has a good grasp of the fundamental principles of copyright. The group noted that in some jurisdictions, specialized courts could be beneficial to the development of a coherent body of copyright law. Where such courts do not exist, raising awareness among the judiciary about the inherently balanced system of copyright law is important. The fourth challenge we identified is increasing pressure on publishers coming from multiple directions to grant free access to copyrighted works, in particular educational materials. This is somewhat linked to the question of awareness raising because such requests often stem from a lack of understanding of the medium to long term damage inflicted upon an educational publishing market and consequently the educational outcomes of that market by disregarding the investment that is necessary in order to produce high quality learning resources. Our fifth and final challenge is the strong advocacy we face from tech companies who aim to weaken copyright protection to benefit their own business models. One case in point is the European legislation for a Digital Services Act, which is currently under discussion. A look at the meetings on this file logged by members of the European Parliament reveals that a few huge tech companies receive far more of policymakers' time than other sectors did. So moving on to the opportunities, the group focused very much on where we stand now based on fairly recent developments, including the pandemic, of course. One effect of the pandemic was to heighten consumers' recognition of the importance of quality content, whether that was reliable science-based information on COVID or recreational reading for lockdown families. The value of high quality learning resources became evident to a huge audience of concerned parents in a new way. Inevitably, this also brought the pressure I already mentioned to grant free access. 
But in terms of awareness of the important role of publishers, we think we see an opportunity, not only for educational publishers. Amid oceans of misinformation, the value of a reliable source of verified information has become clearer than ever. More generally, over the last years, uh, we agreed that there has been a shift in public discourse around the impact of tech business models on our lives. The public is asking questions about tech companies' apparent influence over democratic process, about social media's effects on mental health, about fair competition, and about whether these companies are paying their fair share in taxes. Overall, there is a growing call for regulation of tech companies, including close scrutiny of their role in preventing online crime. Finally, we see considerable opportunities based on publishers' own investments in digital innovation. To date, tailor-made licensing solutions are available to a broad range of users. An excellent example are those educational platforms that have seen so much demand recently. Years worth of investment by publishers was leveraged in the emergency situation of the pandemic. Another example of innovative licensing solutions is the availability of TDM licenses to researchers. Serving the varied needs of society showcases the flexibility of licensing, very often removing any need for exceptions to copyright. The workshop participants felt that these opportunities can help us promote better understanding of copyright, social, economic, and cultural importance by working together to produce compelling evidence-based advocacy on copyright. To achieve this, we will need to rely on sound market data to underpin our arguments and potentially illustrate the impacts of different legislative approaches. Finally, we identified partners with whom we should aim to collaborate in this endeavor. First up are, of course, authors the creators from whom publishers receive any and all rights to their works in the first place. Authors and publishers are natural allies in defending copyright and sometimes the enemies of copyright try to divide us. We should cultivate a close relationship and ongoing dialogue with authors and their representatives. This includes listening to their needs and unique perspective. Next are booksellers, our partners in the book trade. Besides bringing our books to market and giving readers the advice and guidance they appreciate so much, bookshops are important cultural hubs. They often provide a space for debate, learning and literature in their communities. We should collaborate closely with booksellers who are part of an important societal conversation around the impacts of tech, including on high street retail. For educational publishers in particular, it is important to be tuned to the needs of teachers and other educators, including parents. They are best placed to speak to the value of the right learning resources for local needs and curricula. We see opportunities for closer collaboration in this area. Last but not least, WIPO. IPA already works closely with the World Intellectual Property Organization in Geneva. Workshop participants recommended to continue this collaboration and look at more opportunities for awareness raising on copyright, global capacity building, and industry statistics. Thank you very much for listening. And I would like to extend a special thank you to the participants in the copyright workshop who dedicated their time to the discussion and generously shared their thoughts despite everyone's very busy agendas. It is this dedication among publishing professionals that makes this such a wonderful sector to work for. Thank you and stay safe, everyone.